well, and I've shared this with in the class that you were in, uh, my father was a concentration camp survivor, two years of hard labor in Sassenburg, in, in Chemnitz, and um, he, be he became an atheist, because he just, whereas my mother <laughs> was very devout and very um, believing, so it impacted them, I would say, it's 180 degrees, but it was a very interesting, you know, I grew up in, in a household, he, he was a Republican and an atheist, she was a Democrat and a believer, and, and that was the part, that I think they lived together for 30, 50 years because they always agreed to disagree on everything. So, you know, that, you know that's the, the short of it. Kara? I just wanted to ask you, when was your father in the concentration camp, and why was he the, the official reason for this? Right. Uh, that, this, actually, that question impacts on this whole correspondence. My father um, sired a child with a Christian woman, and my half-brother lives in Frankfurt, and um, why does this impact on this letters? And this is one of the unspoken things. I'm very glad, Karen, that you asked this. My grandfather that perished had to give the Gestapo 5,000 marks, which was an incredible sum, to allow my father and mother to leave Nazi Germany for Sweden. And the 5,000 marks was for the education of this illegitimate child. And he claims, Tita, my brother that he never saw that five thousand dollars so so five thousand marks so um, it's all kind of you know and so it impacted them in that they they, they were wealthy but they were short those five thousand rice marks and they needed the as he says in the letters they needed uh, the American relatives to put forward uh, cash so this is all intertwined but my parents were able to leave because of my grandfather's generosity in springing them with that 5,000 Reichmark. It's all intertwined. Steve, hi. Ooh. Hi, Titi. Um, of course, we've known you so many years, or years. 40 family. years. And I remember when you were working on the letters, but I didn't really understand until today what that meant, so thank you. Oh, thank my, you. My question has to do with the photograph of your grandmother. Yes. Um, I wondered if you could describe how you, it was your mother, I think, who discovered the photo. You know part of the story, but you don't know the updated version. This goes on and on. Uh, the, the, the story you know is two sentences. My mother was reading a magazine that was published by Nuremberg called Nuremberg Heute. She goes to page 69 and she sees her mother. She calls up her sister in Tel Aviv, they're very close, and the sister also got this magazine because they both did re uh, um, uh, trips to Nuremberg that were paid for the German government. And he said, she says, well, who do you see on page 69? She said, well, you know, clearly. Um, and then the cousins, Ernie and other, said, well, it's Rosal, I mean, where? But it's very interesting. I was always splitting my head. That train could not have taken them to Poland, not that thousand. Where are they? And then in research at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which I recommend to all of you, it's, the holdings are enormous and they're so generous. Um, there was another picture, the same picture, but the, and said transit camp at Langwasser. I said, well, that's that was the train that took them just to outside of Nuremberg, you know. And but there's something else. There are two other parts of that story that you don't know, and that is they have memorial books at the Holoc at the Jewish Museum, and thousands of visitors come and tear the books apart because they are looking for their relatives. And so they removed the books, alas. They got to put it online, I mean. But as a scholar, you can go to the archives and see mint versions. And my mother's best friend was a 
woman called Tilda Reichsmannsdorfer, and I talked to her in my classes because she saw my parents off in Berlin and the students know the name. And there, her picture is in the memorial book, and the woman to the right of my grandmother is my mom's best friend, Tilda Reichsmannsdorfer. So that's, that's very, you know, that's proof positive. But the other thing that's so interesting is this film that the Gestapo commissioned about the roundup of the Jews that the guards were viewing the night of this transit camp in March of 42. That film was the film of the first deportation. And in 85, the Nuremberg city sponsored a Dürer and other Baroque Renaissance painting exhibit at the Met. And my mom and I went, and we loved it, and Nuremberg Arts, Dürer, what can you say? So overwhelming. But the West German government then, that was 85, at the Goethe Institute opposite, showed this film, which was amazing dialogue. Here, they're so proud of their art, but they're also willing, they know New York, and they know, you know, they're, so we saw this film three times, and never saw her parents. And now, only now, I find that it was only the first deportation, they were on the second deportation. So, all of this history, you know, by the years and research and so on, you, things fall into place. So uh, that's, that's how we found the picture. Right. Please, I'm Bruce. I'm curious, did you become a German scholar before or after that denial of psychology? Very good. Um, I became a German scholar for so many reasons. I became a German scholar as a as a gay man who loves Thomas Mann. I, that was my, you know that was the, you know I love Thomas Mann. You know he sees things. I I got to go. You know I became a, a German major because the one way I could talk to my father was about Wagner. And I became a German scholar because as a Holocaust survivor child, I knew that my past was written in German. So for a whole space, but your Bruce, the question is so pertinent. Yes, in part that, but there's a whole, you know, if you devote your life to a given, and I don't have to tell you as a scholar in the sciences, there are a lot of reasons. But I will tell you that I uh, had a wonderful student, a German major who unfortunately died two years ago, who is the great, great, great son of Benjamin Harrison, and his name was Ben Walker. And the first time I ever taught crematoria poetry, 1977, Paul Ceylon's incredible um, concentration camp poems, I turned to Ben because we were close, he's a New Yorker and all that, and I said, now I know why I'm a journalist. I can teach the Holocaust. So I guess the answer is yes. Right here. Uh, Steve, I heard you comment uh, some time ago, and that's why I'm emboldened to ask the question, on the rather stout appearance yeah. of your grandmother in the photo. I wonder if you could comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that she had everything on, every possession and cloth, and she was a very practical human being, and, um, and uh, she was not that stout, but she had, especially in, in you know, March 42, as a, in a Jewish ghetto, but uh, she had probably every, uh, you know, thing she owned on her person. So uh, that's, you know, I think that's the story there. Um, but she looks, and this is of course um, a picture that it's much grainier than it actually is. In fact, I was shocked at the Jewish Museum this summer. The, the photo was so realistic, you know, but this, this is good and I, I thank Tamis because I at first only wanted to do it small, but then she said this size, and I also thank Ben, because he had it on his computer. Mm -hmm. So at least you have it, um, you know, there. Any other questions? Emily? Oh. Well, when was your mother and, um, and, her, and her sister reunited after? Oh, wow. In 1958, uh, they had not seen each other in 20 years. Thank God I was not there. I had just sprained an ankle, and, you know, as a baseball star. They always called me. Oh, it was hard when I became, I was called me Bucky Knuckles. Um, and, and of course, I sprained my ankle, and I could not attend a reunion, which, which was good. And then they came up to this little castle camp, and um, 
and then I saw my hand for the first time. But the 20 years, I mean, she stayed, thank, you know, she had two kids of her own, and she has now eight great-grandchildren, and she's still alive at 90 mm. in Ramat HaSharon. Um, but, um, you know, my favorite relative, but she stayed with us for four months. So it was, and that was very special. It also forced me to speak German all the time because she didn't speak a word of English. So for four months I was speaking German, which was not very good, but it was fluent. <laughs> yeah. Please, Margie. How does that bring you how old women know? They knew, well, oh. they both were in, you know, Palestine in the U.S. Oh. And she came over oh, okay. in the zip line and, you know, it was a big thing though. And uh, for 20 years they hadn't seen each other. I have to say that um, I'm very moved. And this is totally inappropriate, but in my heart I'm saying, gosh. Oh. Okay. Any other? Please. Merton. I can do without a microphone. When do you plan to incorporate all this into a book, which undoubtedly will become a bestseller? I don't, I don't think it'll be. Yes, it, it's going to be a long. It, I, my plans are to work with this. I really do. And this is. I, I thank the class of 2011. You, you allowed me to break the ice. Um, but it, I will continue to work on it. With, but I, my whole. Motors up. I, I do a little opera, I do a little gender, I do a little how it comes, you know, I, I, it feeds on each other, but I do plan to work on this, absolutely. And there's a wonderful institute in New York, the Jewish um, Institute, and the Evo, and the Leo Beck Institute are reconstituted there, and it's a wonderful place off Union Square, and that, and I'm in touch with them, and I gave them my father's memoirs, too. So, they don't have these yet, but they have my father's memoirs. Thanks for asking. Please. Uh, did your parents ever open up about this ever? Even after it was translated after the wedding? It was such a taboo subject that, uh, it, you know, but, but I knew that there were cousins, my mother had first cousins, who we could not visit because they were the good cousins and the bad cousins. <laughs> and I just, you know, I just didn't want to, you know, but we did, it, it was so close to, you know, there's so, I went to the, I visited my first concert, the first concert in Camp Dachau in 1969 in Germany, all right? I get back home, I wanted to talk to my father about it, and, you know, he wasn't a concert in Camp for two years, and it was so emotional, and my mother said, shut up, and I did. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it was hard, it was very hard. Please, Stephen. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, uh, but yeah, my Amdur, I always followed up on very close to her with the blessing of my grandmother, you know. So I, you know, but the bad cousins. <laughs> oh. By the way, I left their family names out of my translation because for fear maybe their descendants are in the class, you know? But that's all I need, right? So, read that, read that Okay. We have time for one last question right here. Please. Uh, you spoke about how there was a, a hiatus from the letters when your parents were going from Sweden to Japan. And that sort of was like, well, they're in Japan during World War II. Oh, no, no, this was before, this was before Pearl, Luke, this oh, okay. was before Pearl Harbor, okay? okay. So, but just before, because you're absolutely right, they were staying at the Hotel Imperial, and one day they woke up, this is the beginning stages, then they had an apartment, and they saw all these swastikas, they thought, what is going on? Of course, Japan was already, since the beginning, very tight with Nazi Germany, but, but Pearl Harbor didn't, because they were on their way because they had a sponsor, my uncle, to the United States, so they were on their way to the states. So, so they weren't mirroring any of these immigration issues your grandparents were having. They, was there any? No, they, because they had the sponsor. They had my uncle. It was a whole different. Okay. Thank you so much for coming.